Hey everybody, it's Felisa. This is going to be another entry into Spotlight Sunday where I highlight cases of the missing, lost, and endangered. Much of the information that I'll be presenting today is taken from charlieproject.org. I do encourage you to visit that site and if you are in a position financially, please consider a small donation to the site administrator who does an incredible job with putting together these cases from across the nation. Today's case is going to be on Ariana Fitz. In order to understand Ariana's case, we must start with her mother, Nicole. Nicole Nikki Fitz disappeared from San Francisco, California on April 1st, 2016. She was last seen after her shift at Best Buy on Harrison Street that day. It's important to note that there are conflicting reports either saying that she was last seen at work or she was last seen at her residence. Later in the day, she exchanged text messages with relatives saying that she was going to Fresno, California with a friend named Sam. Her family was puzzled by this as Nicole didn't know anyone named Sam and she did not have a car. In the early morning hours of April 2nd, there was a post to Nicole's Facebook page saying, spending time with my three-year-old, need this break. Her family doesn't think that she actually wrote this because number one, Ariana was two, not three, and Nicole wrote with good grammar and spelling. It should be noted that break in this sentence was spelled B-R-A-K-E. Nicole has never been heard from again. Her family reported her missing on April 5th when they said that they couldn't find Ariana either. On April 8th, Nicole's body was found in a shallow grave in McLaren Park covered by a piece of plywood with a symbol spray painted on it. Photos of Nicole and the plywood are going to be posted in this vlog summary. After Nicole was found murdered, police announced that they thought that Ariana was at risk. Nicole was a single mother. She was fi struggling financially prior to her death. She spent a period living in a homeless shelter and has se sent her oldest daughter to live with the child's father in SoCal. While in the shelter, Nicole met a street pastor named Lemasani Briggs, who invited her and Ariana to live with him. Nicole paid Briggs money for rent and for babysitting Ariana, but after a few months, she switched babysitters to Briggs's niece, Ciolo, and Helena. According to Nicole's sister, Briggs was abusive to Nicole, never gave her a key to their shared residence, read her private diary, and sent her text messages calling her names. Nicole's sister and a friend helped Nicole and Ariana escape the situation and picked them up from Briggs' house in November 2015 and took them back to their home in Santa Cruz, California. After Nicole moved to Santa Cruz, she comm commuted two days each way to her job at Best Buy. She worked long hours and stayed with various friends. She often left Ariana with Ciolo and Helena, as well as Helena's husband, Devin Martin. The Martins lived on Castro Street in Oakland, California. Eventually, a co-worker offered Nicole and Ariana a place to stay, but Ariana's babysitters did not want to let her go and wouldn't even let Nicole see her. No one in Ariana's family had seen Ariana since sometime in mid-February 2016, which was about six weeks before her mother's murder. According to Nicole's roommate, Nicole planned to try and retrieve her daughter on the day she disappeared. Nicole was reportedly very upset because she hadn't been able to see her, and her roommate urged her to seek help from the police to get her back. Police stated that Hearn and the Martins were refusing to cooperate with the investigation and had provided inconsistent statements. It's worth noting that Helena previously served a six-year prison term for killing the father of her child. They haven't been named as suspects in Nicole's homicide or Ariana's disappearance, however. Ariana's family hopes that she is still alive and being cared for. Prior to Nicole's death, she and Ariana frequented the San Francisco, San Mateo, Oakland, Emeryville, Fresno, Santa Cruz, and the Sil Silicon Valley areas of the state. Investigators believe that Ariana could be anywhere in California, and her case remains unsolved. I did want to cite a couple of things that were pointed out by San Francisco we Weekly, as I think that it gives a more complete picture as to what occurred in the timeline of this case. Number one, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading Charlie Project um, was how on earth did her body go undiscovered in a park? And San Francisco Weekly did indicate that 
um, this particular park had long been considered a good place to dump a body, that it was overgrown with weeds and tall plants, dense bushes. Um, it largely was overgrown and very unkempt. It's about 312 acres of open space. And so, um, you know, this is quite a large park. And, you know, most people who know the area know their way around this park. And so it would be very easy to conceal a body. Furthermore, um, Nicole's body was not out in, out in the open. Um, it was concealed uh, in a shallow grave and under some plywood. It was only when the city decided that they were going to clean up this park and dedicated some financial resources to doing so that an excavator uh, unearthed uh, Nikki's shallow grave. At the time that she was discovered, you know, even though she had been reported missing, you know, then it became an even more pressing question of where was Ariana, who was two at the time. One of the things that her sister Tess did give for this article, um, which I thought was very interesting, was the nature of the relationship with this La Samani person, um, meaning that beyond the fact that he was exhibiting some extremely controlling behavior, like not giving her a key to an apartment, you can she can only access the apartment if someone was there, i.e. if he was there. Um, otherwise, I don't know where she was supposed to go um, if he wasn't there, but he had taken to reading her personal information, her telephone messages, her text messages. Uh, she kept a diary or a journal of some kind of... Uh, of something of that nature on a computer and so he was using that in order to gain information for her um, and once the situation became unbearable and uh, Tess and her friend went to go get Nikki and bring them back to her house and to safety and, and Nikki and Ariana brought them back to safety Tess said that he started to send her very harassing text messages including bring my baby back which that st really did, you know, send chills down my spine that this was more than just a um, controlling kind of relationship. This really was a dominating and manipulative and extreme, exceedingly abusive type of situation. Um, Nikki's friend Claire did express some apprehension, apprehension and trepidation that. Lasamani's nieces were caring for Adriana, but Nikki said that, you know, the nieces weren't really in contact with the uncle. She felt comfortable that, you know, they wouldn't um, harm her and that, you know, it would be fine. Tess did say that she felt that Nikki was being exceedingly naive about the situation and that it just did not sit well with her. Eventually, um, it did become known that Tess was homeless and she really didn't have anywhere to go. And this became known to her closest friends at work. One of her um, co-workers noticed that Nikki was spending a lot more time at work even after her shift was ended and, you know, just kind of hanging around the break room, et cetera, et cetera. And through uh, a series of events, they did find out that Nikki was indeed homeless and didn't have anywhere to go and so one of the co-workers did uh, offer a place to stay for Nikki and for Adriana to give them a little bit more stability and you know create a, a home environment for them and this was something that Nikki was really looking forward to she'd gone out and bought furniture for her and you know was really intent on making a home she eventually did contact the sisters to say, you know, hey, I'm coming to get my daughter. And this is where the story really takes a very deep and dark turn. Nikki was prevented from going to get her daughter. She was told that um, Adriana was being taken to uh, Disneyland or Disney World, one of the Disneys. And um, Nikki was very upset about this because she hadn't been given a heads up and she was frustrated because she wanted to go and get her daughter. Her sister Tess said that, you know, as was her style, Nikki kept, Nikki kept much of the struggle to herself. Um, 
they don't know how long it had been before uh, that Nikki had seen Adriana before she was killed because she kept a lot of her struggle to herself. At any rate, at the day, the day of her disappearance, the family doesn't believe that these text messages came from her, does not believe that the Facebook post was from her. She didn't show up for work the next day. Um, she had mentioned that she was going to um, one place and then she, you know, texted that she was in Fresno and her sister was like, you know, how does it go from I'm going, I'm going to BJ's to now I'm in Fresno. One of her friends did see her withdraw a large sum of money, but again, true to form, Nikki didn't disclose what it was for. One of her coworkers, her friend, her friend thought that she took the money out to give to the family, thinking that she would get Adriana back if she did so, but that is speculative. I'm going to end there with, you know, the published reports because a lot of it is really more, we don't know what happened. That's the bottom line. And, you know, there are so many different moving parts to this that it gets to be very convoluted after a while. I will say this, having read the story and, um, in the, San, in the San Francisco Weekly, and then also looking at the profile in Charlie Project, a couple of things really stuck out to me. Even though the family doesn't think that um, Nicole knew anyone named Sam, Les Amani, I would, you know, I kind of get Sam as a nickname out of that. I don't know, I could be reaching, but that's like, that was my uh, first thought when I read that. Um, it also could have been, you know, some type of code or some type of um, hearing that uh, Nikki was throwing out there to kind of throw them off the scent. You know, maybe she was meeting with someone to try and arrange for Ariana's return um, and didn't really want the family involved because she didn't want to hear, you know, their commentary or perhaps she thought that they were going to be negative or try and talk her out of it. Um, at true to form with her being so very pri private, her taking money out, her moving very discreetly, her not wanting to disclose, you know, everything that she was doing would have been typical for her. And unfortunately, in this situation, it does not serve her well because now people are trying to piece together exactly what happened on the back end because they did not get the information from her. And she could have just not wanted to have the scrutiny and to have the the disappointment from her family. She may have also thought that this was a situation that she created for herself and she needed to do something in order to get out of it. Unfortunately, this probably helped um, whoever did this to her go undetected for so long because no one actually knows who she was meeting, who she was talking to, or who she would have been um, involved with at the time of her disappearance. One thing is for certain, those people that are involved should be brought to justice. And I'm hopeful that the San Francisco PD and FBI and other law enforcement agencies that are, are involved in this case will be able to uncover and unearth enough information and enough evidence that will be able to point them in the right direction of a suspect and bring them to swift and immediate justice. No matter what though, no matter the outcome of this murder investigation, there is still a six-year-old baby girl who is out in the world without her mother and without her biological family. We don't know where Adriana is. So it's important that if you know anything about this case or if you have any idea what could have happened to her, that you please contact the San Francisco Police Department at 415 Five five three zero one two three, or you can contact the Federal Bureau of Investigation at four one five 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 three seventy four hundred. No matter the outcome of Nicole's case, again, like I said, there's a six year old baby who is lost in the world without her mother. There's a family who is desperately searching for her, wanting to rejoin with the biological offspring of their departed loved one and no matter what it's time to bring adriana home y'all be blessed <laughs>